Hey, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for the gospel. We thank you, Lord, for the good news that it is unto every man and woman that Christ died for our sins and that on the third day you rose him from the grave. And Lord, because Jesus rose from the grave, anything is possible to those who believe. Lord, we thank you for that good news. May that sink down deep in our hearts, not just this season because we're getting into the Easter mode, but may that sink in and ring true every single day of our lives. Lord, today, as we open your word, as we hear about your word, may every word that comes out of my mouth be yours. And Father, give uh, us the wisdom today to discern what your will for our lives is. Open our eyes to see what you want us to see from the Bible. Open our ears to hear what you want us to hear from it. And most importantly, may your spirit open our hearts today that we would respond and become the disciples you want us to be. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, my message title today is, Now I Would Remind You of the gospel. And you know, these words are straight from the text that we're going to be reading today. Um, And and so I want to spend a good chunk of this message today reminding us about the gospel. Um, And you know, reminders can be a little bit annoying, especially because they're often related to things that we don't feel like doing, right? Um, You know, but they can be very helpful since we as human beings can be so prone to forget. And we all have people in our lives who are just good at reminding us about stuff. Anybody know what I'm talking about? In my world, it's called my spouse, okay? Um, And here are a few things that my wife frequently reminds me. Here's one. Put your dirty laundry in the dirty laundry basket, okay? (laughs) She would feel so good by that. Thank you. Uh, She'd say, it's almost 8 o'clock. It's time to take Nigel to school when I'm out there drinking my coffee, having a good time. Here's one that I get frequently. I'm over here. Put your phone down. (laughs) We're married, so let's connect at the end of the day and not just watch TV. Ouch and guilty. Any other husbands ever lived in any of those dog houses before? <clears throat> well, here are a few things that I remind my kids, okay? Take your hands out of your mouth, okay? Take your hands out of your pants, you know? Keep your pants on. Keep your shirt on. Go to the bathroom. Wash your hands after you go to the bathroom. Uh, You know, don't touch that. (laughs) Don't just run and hide. Here's another one. You need to share. Or every day, it's time for bed, you know? I could go on and on, but those are just a few of the good old highlights. Now I'll share a few of the things that I sometimes remind our staff here around the church. So here are a few. One of them is think like a church member, not just like a church leader. Another one that I say uh, frequently is that leaders like things big, but people like it small. And another one that I say is don't just expect people to flock to your ministry to volunteer. Go to the people and invite them to be a part of it. Uh, another thing I often reiterate, it's not me, it's just a I've heard this around, I say it a lot, is pray like it all depends on God, uh, but work like it all depends on you. (laughs) Um, I often use the hunter-gatherer analogy of, you know, like the old and, you know, like just when that, like if you didn't kill, you didn't eat. I'm like, not that we're trying to kill you guys, okay, but I'm just like, you know, just imagine that you got to go out there and you got to hunt, you know. Another thing I say a lot is do the hard things first in your day. I say a lot too, do the best you can with the time you have, the resources at your disposal, and the talent that God gives you. And if you've done that at the end of the day, you can feel good about yourself. I often also say strive for excellence, but sometimes good enough is okay. Um, And sometimes done is better than perfect. Amen? Um, And if things are stressful, another thing that I say a lot is everybody play nice in the sandbox. Okay? (laughs) Now, one thing our staff frequently reminds me whenever I say some of those things is, Kyle, it's not that simple. (laughs) 
And in their defense, it never is. Um, and one thing Pastor Willie, who preaches here from time to time, frequently reminds me is he often says to me, facts are our friends, whether we like them or not. And another one that he says a lot is, let's just do the right thing because it's the right thing. And I just, I love it when he says that. See, all of us have important relationships and friendships in our lives that remind us of the important things that we need to keep in mind. Um, and thank God for those people. Thank God for for those little reminders that, that they give us from time to time, we need them to stay on track. But the thing is, the most important thing that we really need the most to stay on track every day is often the one that gets dumped at the bottom of our list, and that is the reminder of the gospel. You, you know, the Christian life, it centers around the gospel and its power in a person's life. And when the centrality of my life is based around the truth of the gospel, gospel, everything else falls into place. And when a person becomes a Christian, you know what happens? God steps in. He transforms you from the inside out. It's all new. It's all fresh. And the power of the gospel is obvious. But if we are not intentional, the significance of the gospel in our daily lives can slip into the background a little bit. I need to remind myself of the gospel. I need to be reminded of the gospel, and we need to remind one another of the power of the gospel. And so as Paul works towards the conclusion of 1 Corinthians, uh, in, here we're getting to chapter 15, he ends it with the most important reminder there could ever be. He ends it with the reminder of the gospel. But before we get there, we need to address what I'm calling the biblical elephant in the room, okay? So when you came in today, you should have gotten a note sheet. Uh, you can uh, open it up now or you can follow along digitally at lovehopecity.com slash notes. And the first thing that I have there is a question. It says, what is up with 1 Corinthians 14, 35, or 34 and 35? You know, if you were trekking along with the message last week, you noticed that I ended things at, at uh, verse 33, and it would have been really easy for me to just go right to chapter 15 and breeze past this. Um, and we're going to make our way to 1 Corinthians 15. But before I get there, I have to make a pit stop at an important destination along the way. You know, I always have to make pit stops on road trips. How many of you people are with me? You know, I, I am like not much fun to travel with in a car. And I define a long trip as anything over 30 minutes, just for a frame of reference, okay? Um, and small children have significantly larger bladders than I do. So if you'll excuse me, I'll be right back. And I, I'm, I'm just kidding. I, I'm doing fine. Um, <laughs> but jokes aside, you know, on the way to Paul's uh, reminder here in 1 Corinthians 15, I really have to address something that I didn't have time to get to in last week's message from verses. 34 and 35. Um, and if offhand you're not familiar with what's going on there, this is the text in the Bible where Paul says that women should be silent in the church and fully submissive, presumably referring to their husbands and to the male church leadership. Now, for obvious reasons, this is a super fun verse for a privileged white male to preach on in 2022. <laughs> I thought that was a good joke, but it landed moderately well. Anyway, we'll move along there. Um, but we have to spend a teeny bit of time here before we move on to chapter 15. And so now that I have your attention, I'm going to read it, and I'm going to do my very best to unpack this. And I'm probably going to make everyone angry at the end of the day in some way. So if I have a church next week, it is going to be a miracle from God, okay? So verse 34 says, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Wow, exciting one for the day. Um, Obi, where are you? Come back to me. He always leaves me with these. I don't know why that happens. Anyway, Frankly, I'll start out and I'll say this. I can't say with 100% certainty what this was speaking to or, or what it was speaking about. What I can say is this, and anytime we come to the Bible, we have to remind ourselves of this. These are real letters 
written to real people. And these are real situations. And just like the names, that they were clear to the people 2,000 years ago who they were being written to. It made sense to them then, but it doesn't always make sense to us today. Now, that being said, I'm going to give my best shot today at explaining what I think is happening, okay? And so the big question here, and some Christians see this differently, and if you see this differently than me, that's okay. We can still be friends. But the question is, was Paul making a command for all times for all churches that women should be silent in the church. And let me just come right out and say my position on this personally. I believe that women should definitely not be silent in the church, at the workplace, in the home, or anywhere else. (laughs) I believe that the Bible does not place any limits on what a woman can do in ministry. And I strongly believe that mutual submission is the Bible's overarching picture, never one way submission. And any husband who has ever played the wives need to submit card in an argument has already lost his wife's heart. I also believe, I expected more of an amen there than a laughter, but you know what? That probably means it's resonating with some of you. That's good. Uh, you know, and, and I also believe this, a godly woman will willingly submit to a godly husband who helps her feel hard, safe, and loved, and give her time and space to have her own thoughts and her own opinions. Now, at the same time that I say all of that, I have to say that we cannot bow to the woke culture of our day that wants us to reinterpret the Bible through the lens of modern society. That's equally problematic. So we have to make sure that our conclusions that we come to are biblically consistent and theologically applicable. And I believe that this interpretation of verses 34 and 35 meets that criteria. Um, And so here's what I'll have you jot down. And uh, it's the first thing on your note sheet. Since it's not reaffirmed anywhere else in the Bible and has nothing to do with morality, it's safe to say it was probably unique uh, or cultural to Corinth at that time, okay? Um, So the question is this, how then do we interpret these verses today? Well, we interpret these verses the same way we make sense of any other tough verse or set of verses in the Bible. We interpret scripture using the rest of scripture. And, and that's how we understand the hard passages that we come across. And whenever you come across a text that's difficult for you to understand in the Bible, always start by asking yourself, is this concept restated? Um, if so, how is it restated? Is it a similar way? Because I'll get to that uh, in a second. Or 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 does it appear to be just a truly isolated incident here? And the bottom line is this, there is nowhere in the Old or New Testament that reiterates the the need for women to be silent in the church. Um, Now, if anything, we see all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament how God uses women greatly, and it is clear there is a tremendous place for women in ministry. And we shouldn't ever use this thinking, though, as an excuse to dance around a verse when it's tough. But the bottom line is that if something is used in a singular application like this, that's an indicator uh, that it may have been cultural or it may have been specific to that place in time. Now, let's talk about Corinth for a second. We've already talked about a lot that we know the whole sex cult and sex prostitution stuff was a part of pagan worship at that time. Um, And and so because of that, um, it's plausible, and you can understand why it would have made folks uncomfortable to see women leading and speaking, given the cultural background and things that they were going through. You know, another verse that I didn't teach on in Corinthians, because I plan to get to it here, uh, is is chapter 11, verses 2 through 16 that talks about women wearing a head covering. Um, I don't see too many women wearing a head covering today in here. Okay, and and listen, um, it it says that if a woman doesn't cover her head in the church, that she's bringing dishonor to her husband. Now, obviously, we don't do head coverings in here, and we also don't think that head coverings are, are something that needs to be done in the New Testament church today. And the question is, why is that? Well, it's the same rationale as this passage. Neither head coverings nor the silence of women in the church are reaffirmed anywhere else in the Bible. And neither of them have anything to do with with morality in the Bible. And so that's another huge indicator. Uh, Now, sometimes though, people on the other side of the fence of of this conversation about women in ministry uh, would push back on what I'm saying right now. And they would say, well, you know what, Pastor Kyle, that's a slippery slope to say that this verse is called 
cultural uh, because then, you know, people could say that anything that they don't like in the Bible is cultural and they could just use that as a way to just kind of throw that out. And where that argument is usually leading for the record has to do with God's standards for sexual morality. Um, and, and I think personally that's a false comparison uh, because in my opinion, there are strong indicators here that this was isolated what was happening in Corinth and, uh, and it's not reaffirmed elsewhere in, in the Bible. So my position is there are no limits to what a woman can do in life or in ministry. Now I do have to add one little caveat. Uh, if you're a voracious Bible person, uh, in 1 Timothy 2.12, which is also written by Paul, and I'll go ahead and uh, just head over there real quick and, and just allude to it. But in 1 Timothy 2.12, Paul says something remarkably similar. Um, and he's talking to Timothy, who is leading a church, and, and he says similar thing. He says, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. And then in verse 12, he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Um, so first off, I would say that's Paul writing to uh, the, a pastor, Timothy, who is leading the same subset and, and people in the church at that time. So that's consistent for me. Uh, now, having said that, the way that we understand that in our capacity within our church leadership today is that we try our very best here at City Church to have women under women and men under men in terms of authority structures as much as we can. Uh, but it's not an absolute for us uh, because we understand that, you know, there are certain things where you have to figure out how these structures work and things like that. Different people understand this differently. If you want to research the theological position a little bit more, I take the position of a complementary. You can look that up on your own. So now to the rest of the message, okay? <laughs> um, and, and listen, I, I, I know that this is a hot topic, uh, and I know that some of you are going to have different opinions on all sides of, uh, of this, um, and, and so I gave it my best shot. You can send me your email. I might not respond to it about, you know, how to counter this and that, and what about this opinion, okay? But I did my best, and I'm moving on. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you. Two people. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I see a lot of women clapping right now. So, you know, I think next week it's going to be like the women's ministry of City Church here. And anyway, um, but seriously, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. Now, I re would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Um, you know, what we just read was an amazing reminder of the gospel. And we're going to spend literally all of the weeks leading up to Easter in 1 Corinthians 15. There is so much here about the resurrection and the power of the gospel. Um, and so next up on your note sheet, what I've got for you is four important reasons that we need frequent gospel reminders. And the first one is this. Gospel reminders help us keep the good news fresh. In verse one, Paul says that the Corinthians received the gospel and they were now standing upon it. And you know, the gospel is not like food in the sense that it ever expires or it ever grows old. The gospel is always new. It's always fresh. What we have to do is we have to work to keep it fresh in our own hearts and in our own lives. And, and just like the Corinthians who stood on the gospel after having received it, most of us in here today, I would suggest, have already received the gospel at some point in our lives. And now we are standing upon it. It's the foundation and the truth that we've built our lives around. But having said that, you know, because of our human nature and the way that we are, we quickly forget whatever it is we fail to keep fresh. It's never nefarious. It just kind of happens. Uh, you know, every Christian, 
has to work hard to keep the gospel and the Bible fresh in their minds and fresh in their hearts. Even those who have earned significant academic degrees have to work to keep whatever information they learned fresh in their minds. You know, now in my case, I studied the Bible pretty diligently in school for four years in college, and then I studied for another, well, let's just say several uh, years after for my master's in biblical and theological studies from Talbot Seminary. Thank you. Yeah, go Talbot. Woo! That's right. Biola Talbot. That's right. And, and I did. And here's the problem though. You know, Pastor Kyle's college degree is going to be old enough to have a driver's license in May. Okay. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. How many of you remember what you were doing or what you were learning 16 years ago in your life? You could probably like, you know, sit back and maybe kind of try to figure it out. Um, and, and there may be a few of you. By the way, my wife has that kind of a memory. You ask her, she can just, boom, I was here. This is what was going on. It's incredible. I don't have that kind of a memory. But anyway, I don't, that's not me. Um, now, of course, though, I remember bits and pieces here and there. But here's the thing. When someone reminds me of something and they say, oh, oh you remember when we took New Testament together with, with such and such and, and we didn't think we were going to get through it? Or, you know, remember when we had that Greek class together with, with Professor Kwok and none of us thought that we were going to pass the class? Then all of a sudden I remember and I go, oh yeah, I totally remember that. And, and you'd think though, and then with all the schooling, you know, I could quickly just capitulate to you the themes of any Bible book from memory. I could quote vast amounts of scripture on command, boom, 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 boom. And, and I could be familiar with all the theologians that I wrote papers about and all the church history that, uh, you know, I learned during that time. And, and that it's all just locked in there waiting to just come out at a moment's notice. Man, I so wish that were true. <laughs> it would make preaching so much easier if that was the case. But the fact is this, man, I got to fight to keep the good news fresh in my mind, just like everyone else, or it just becomes part of the foggy and distant past in my life. You know, most higher education fields require some kind of ongoing, continuing education. I know nurses and doctors definitely have to. I know teachers have to. Uh, I know lawyers have to do that as well. And and friends, there are few topics in our lives that we can just assume are going to stay locked in our brains and, you know, that we can pick up without even thinking about, and we can expect to have them right then and there at the forefront of our mind. You know what we need instead? We need reminders. We need to be reminded and we need to remind ourselves. We need to grow even beyond what we knew and we need to continually expand what we already know. See, no one can just coast on past success or past knowledge. Coasting on past success or past knowledge is often a precursor to a very big fall. We need to keep it fresh. Reminding ourselves of the gospel is what, how, one of the ways that we keep it fresh in our hearts and in our minds. Here's the second gospel reminder that we all need on a regular basis. Gospel reminders confirm our faith and they reveal our hearts. Gospel reminders confirm our faith and they reveal our hearts. In verse two, Paul says he is reminding Christians of the gospel. And then he says, by which they are being saved in the present and ongoing tense. Now, what an interesting choice of tense for Paul to use for that verb as it refers to Christians understanding the gospel specifically. Paul says Christians are being transformed by the gospel in the present ongoing sense. And this kind of makes my theological head get scratched a little bit at first glance because I thought salvation happened at a moment in time. Uh, you know, I, happened, I thought it happened when I prayed that prayer when I was 13 years old. So, so does this mean that we can lose our salvation? Well, I don't have a perfect, simple explanation for you on that, uh, but I don't think a truly converted Christian can lose their salvation. I'll start with that. I do think there are a lot of people who look like or who go through the motions uh, of, of a saved Christian who actually aren't. Um, and so what Paul was saying is that Christians are being saved in an ongoing sense because a Christian's ongoing commitment to follow Jesus daily is what confirms a person's salvation. You know, when I get to heaven, 
I don't think Jesus is just going to ask me if I prayed a prayer one time in my life. Be like, oh, you know what? Great, you're good. That was it. You know, there was nothing else you needed to do. You just needed to say the magic word and boom, enter into the kingdom for all time. You know, I think Jesus is going to ask me how I lived my life every day after I prayed that prayer. Um, Because what I did after I prayed that prayer actually confirms whether I meant that prayer or not. And of course, Jesus is going to forgive all our sins if we truly accept him into our lives. And Jesus also knows we aren't perfect. That's why he came. We never will be perfect. But if all we ever did is pray a prayer and we never made any substantive changes in our lives as a response to the gospel, did we really even mean what we prayed or spoke about in the first place? See, the gospel reveals our hearts. Gospel reminders, even to a Christian, reveals the quality of their heart. And, 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 and so I want to ask you a question. How do you respond to reminders about things that you already know? Because that's the response to Christians who already know the gospel. You know, I, I know this stuff. I've heard it. I don't need to be reminded. So when you're reminded of something that you feel like you already know, how do you respond? Do you say, you know, oh, man, that's, that's so annoying. Why do they have to tell me that again? <laughs> do you get frustrated or you go, you know what? Wow, that's good. I needed that reminder today. I, I feel back on track now. And, and thank you for that little a little, little helpful reminder right there. See, gospel reminders confirm our faith, but they also reveal our hearts. And how we respond to those little reminders shows whether we're staying soft and tender to the things of God or whether we're hardening our hearts in some way. So gospel reminders confirm our faith and they reveal our hearts. Here's the third thing to know about gospel reminders. Gospel reminders help us maintain our spiritual conditioning. You know, the first thing someone loses whenever they stop working out is their conditioning. You know, the muscle memory of how to do something stays a whole lot longer than the conditioning to actually do the thing. Uh, Here's what I mean by that. You know, my body will remember how to do the mechanics of a shoulder press, a squat, or a power clean, or, you know, for some of you, uh, how to shoot some hoops if that was your thing, or how to swim, uh, or how to go running, or something like that. But my body will wear out as I try to do those things like I used to do them if I haven't been disciplining myself to keep doing them. Does that make sense to you? Um, And and the same thing is true spiritually, by the way. You know, we need to keep up our our spiritual conditioning really daily um, because when we don't, whenever we get back into Bible study or or Bible uh, uh, or prayer uh, or, or, you know, even just going to church or being in a small group, what we'll find is that we'll feel like it's some massive time commitment that we're unprepared for. Our focus is going to be lacking. Our head's going to be all over the place and and we'll give up more quickly on it. Those little reminders of the importance of living out the gospel, even for a saved Christian, it helps us keep the perspective of why we're conditioning ourselves to keep doing the things that we're doing. The difference between living for the gospel and every other form of discipline that you already do in your own life um, is that it's not about us doing something for just self-improvement in and of itself. Verse three says, Christ died for me. I didn't earn my salvation, and I also won't earn God's approval from my obedience. But when I serve a God who gave everything so that this messed up, broken, dead sinner could be made alive and spend an eternity with God, the natural response is, man, what what can I do to give my life back to you, Lord? Reminders of the gospel help us maintain our spiritual conditioning and our ongoing obedience. And the fourth thing is about gospel reminders is gospel reminders refocus us on what really matters. When we take our eyes off what matters most, we start to drift in life, don't we? We forget who we are. We forget who is around us that we care about. We forget why we're doing whatever it is that we're doing. And we mostly focus on things that feed our own desires. And when life becomes about us, we've lost our focus. Those little gospel reminders refocus us on what really matters, on who really matters, on what this life is all about. And you know, sometimes we come to church and we're praying for some massive divine revelation from God, myself included in that. I always pray for that. It's a great thing to pray for. And sometimes God is faithful and he even gives me that. But other times, maybe I would say most of the times, uh, God speaks to me through just little bitty reminders that I need to refocus on. And for me, that's actually encouraging for me as a Christian because that means that for the most part, we're on track. We, we aren't like, you know, off in some crazy, you know, uh, 
prodigal son, prodigal daughter story. Or we're just, we just need a little bit of refocusing in some area of our lives. And that little refocus on the gospel reminds me, God loves me. God has a plan for me. God has a plan for this world. I am a part of God's plan to reach my world. And that God's plan for me is bigger than my plan for me. And you know, if I don't live up to my human potential for whatever reason, but I do everything God says I was supposed to do, I can rest easy as a Christian because Jesus told me what this life is supposed to be about. So gospel reminders give us perspective on our own lives and they refocus us on the things that truly matter. So what I wanna do now is I wanna give all of us three gospel truths to remind ourselves of daily. And these really just come straight from 1 Corinthians 15, uh, one through 11. And the first one is the story and the historical facts about the gospel. And verses three through eight is where this is laid out in 1 Corinthians 15. First part of the story that Paul gets at is that Christ died for our sins. Uh, Just the good old news of the gospel. Uh, The second thing that he lays out is that it was in accordance with the scriptures. It was prophesied about, it was planned about. Uh, No one else could be our Messiah. There's these amazing descriptions that are given about the odds that one person could fulfill all the messianic prophecies that are in the Bible the way that Jesus did. Um, And it's just phenomenal if you study this kind of stuff. The third fact that Paul puts out there in in chapter 15, he says Jesus was buried and he was raised on the third day. And then he goes on and he says, then he appeared to Peter. Now, this is really significant part of the story for me personally, because Peter was the guy that betrayed Jesus. And that gives me hope when I turn my back on the Lord. If the guy that really hurt Jesus the most was the first one that he came to, Uh, after it all happened, I can feel confident that he'll come to me when I blow it too. Uh, You know, Peter was saved, but he did something stupid that was very sinful. I'm not going to ask how many of you have been there because a lot of us have, all of us have in some way, shape, form, or fashion. And that little gospel reminder that he came to Peter reminds me, you know what? If, G- if Jesus let him get back on the horse, he's gonna let Kyle get back on the horse too. He's gonna let you get back on the horse too. And then it says he appeared to the 12. And this is another great fact of the gospel story. One reason it's so powerful to me is because 11 out of the 12 disciples wound up dying a martyr's death for the sake of Christianity and according to their uh, church history. Um, you know, I've, I've often said that, you know, maybe you could get one person to die for a lie. You know, if it really was this man-made thing of propagating human power and all the things that people say about the church that don't believe in God. Maybe you stand in the circle and you go, ah, sorry, Pete, you drew the straw. We need to keep our system of, you know, male power and all that going here. And so you got to take it. Maybe you convince one guy to die for the lie, but there is no way 11 people in a row die for the exact same lie because they refuse to admit that, or, or say or re, that, that Jesus hadn't risen for, from the dead or recant their faith. So for me, that little fact is one of those things that just slams home the truth of the gospel for me. And then it says in the text that he appeared to over 500 people. You know, and this one always astonishes me too. It's one of my favorite facts about Christianity because, you know, a person might conjure up a story uh, or, or have a hallucination. You know, if they think, oh, Jesus, I saw him appear, maybe they hallucinated or whatever. Uh, but 500 plus people sharing the exact same hallucination is absolutely impossible. And at the time that it was written, uh, Paul even says most of them are still alive. And so there would have been people that could refute it. So remind yourself of the story and the historical facts of the gospel. It'll help you in your own life. Here's the second thing we need to remind ourselves of frequently, the story and the facts of how God transformed me. And I would argue this is equally as important as the historical facts of the gospel. You know, verses 9, 10, uh, and 11, uh, really, you see Paul talking about his own story. And in verse 9, he says, I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And so you see his heart there. Um, And then finally, he goes on in, in, in 10, he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. You know, 
I don't know if any of us have actually had Jesus appear to us personally when we got saved like he did to the Apostle Paul. And, and I'm not saying it's impossible that somebody would have that kind of an experience. I have heard of stories here and there. I've never personally seen it. I can tell you that. I think for most of us, uh, the story we need to remind ourselves of is the story of and the facts about how God transformed us from the inside out. You know, maybe it was a moment in time. And you heard a sermon in a church building somewhere. It felt like you were the only person in the room. You felt like they'd been, you know, hacked your email and were reading everything that was going on in your life. And and all of a sudden, you just felt like the Holy Spirit just zoned in on you and on your life. Maybe it was a moment in time. Uh, Maybe you knew God most of your life. Maybe it was over a period of time that you committed your life over to to God. Uh, Maybe, you know, you had some things happen in your life and, and you had some questions that you started to ask yourself bigger questions like, why am I here? What happens when I die? All that kind of stuff. And you had a friend who started talking to you about God and slowly but surely you explored God, you explored the Bible, you explored Christianity. And at some point in time, you stepped over the line yourself and became a Christian. For me, I accepted Jesus un questionably at a moment in time, but it took a couple years after to start giving my life over to the Lord. I am still a work in progress, okay? I will give that to you every single day, but I can tell you that I went from a struggling 13-year-old who did not believe in Jesus, who did not believe in the Bible or Christianity, to a 15-year-old kid uh, who was on fire for God with a calling to lead in ministry. And God grabbed me, he turned me around, and he said, me on a course that would ultimately result in me preaching this message to you uh, today. So remind yourself of the facts and the story of the gospel and remind yourself of the facts and the story of God, how God transformed you. Um, It will keep the gospel fresh in your own life. And the third gospel reminder that we all need is how the power of the gospel continues to be at work in my life today. And I love how in verses 10 and 11, Paul says, By the grace of God, I am what I am. Man, that just sums down my life right there. It was only by God's grace that a persecutor of the church could be used to write almost the most Bible of anyone in church history, certainly in the New Testament. The grace of God that drew Paul to work in his life continued to be at work in his life until the day that he died. And that same grace of God remains at work in you and it remains at work within me today. The power of the gospel was not just something that happened when you prayed that sinner, pr- sinner's prayer once. The power power of the gospel is something we continually tap into every time through prayer. Um, And every day through obedience and sacrifice and worship, we tap into the power of the gospel. And by the grace of God, we are who we are. God's grace towards us was not, is not, nor ever will be in vain. And because of the gospel, Paul said that he worked harder than anyone else. And he did more for God uh, because of what God had done for him. And that same thing remains true for us. When we remember what God's done for us and and our story and how God continues to be at work, we're going to be inspired to do more for God uh, because we're going to think about all that remains ahead and that he's not done with us. There's, There's still a plan. There's still a race that he's calling us to run. And so now, friends, I would remind you of the gospel. And so I want to end with a question for every single one of you today to think about. How is the power of the gospel continuing to be at work in your life today? How is the power of the gospel continuing to be at work in your friendships around you? Maybe the circumstances where somebody might have hurt you uh, or, or there's some tension. Where does the power of the gospel want you, where does God want you to step in with the power of the gospel in that situation? How is the power of the gospel at work in terms of your contentment within yourself? When we look around in the world, it's easy to see people have this and others don't have that. And you know, we can, no matter how you play the comparison game, you always lose. Uh, there's always somebody better further along and there's always somebody you can look at and feel like, oh, wow, I'm not there and feel better about yourself. And God says, with the power of the gospel, we can be content within ourselves. How is the power of the gospel at work within you at your job? I wanna remind us all that we didn't earn whatever job that we are currently in. We all partnered with God to get 
to wherever we are. And if that's true, here's the best part of that story. We can rest easy in the fact that we won't lose our current job unless God says so. It's his power that got us there. It's his sustaining power that's gonna keep us there. But at the same time, you know, the gospel reminds me that because I am a Christian, Christians who understand what God did for them, we work harder than anybody else out there. And it's not because of our boss or who we report to. It's because God is working in and through us. How is the power of the gospel working in your marriage today? Are you growing in grace and forgiveness for one another or are the rolling of the eyes and the disappointments and the dissatisfactions of life stacking up and and that's starting to win? It's a choice. How is the gospel at work in your parenting? You know, parent guilt is a very real thing that I never understood until I was a parent. (laughs) Paul says, parents, I would remind you of the gospel. Embrace God's grace for wherever you have fallen, even as a parent. Let the gospel into your life, into your heart. How is the power of the gospel even working in terms of your own personal obedience to the Lord? Have you been on track with God or, or maybe does it feel really duty-based and you have, but you, you, just, you just feel like it's just like a set of things that you just do, maybe super religious, or maybe some of you, you've slipped back a little bit and, and maybe you felt unworthy of the love of God as a result in your life. You know, some of you, you might well believe in the power of the gospel for other people and that God's grace applies to them, but you don't really think that that same grace and that same forgiveness applies to you. And God would say to you, wherever you are in terms of your obedience, I would remind you of the power of the gospel. See, if Jesus forgave Peter, if he appeared to him and he restored him into ministry, Jesus will forgive you too. Jesus will restore you. Uh, But you and I have to let the power of the gospel in on that healing journey for that actually to happen in our lives. We need to be reminded of the power of the gospel. And as the gospel is brought back into every area of our lives, the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit begin to step in. And that's when we die just a little bit every day to ourselves. And that's when we say, it is truly no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gospel, that it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And we thank you, Lord, that we are being saved, that we are being drawn to you, that you are continuing to call us to higher, to greater and better. And so, Lord, may that fresh reminder come into our lives today of the power of Christ. And if you're here today or watching and you were to die today and you genuinely don't know if you'd go to heaven when you die, let me remind you of the gospel. God promises to do four things for you. He promises to forgive you of all your sins. He promises to adopt you into his family. He promises to fill you with his Holy Spirit. And he promises you an eternal life that's beyond anything that you could ask for, dream, or imagine. There's only one catch. Jesus wants the steering wheel of your heart today. And so if that's you, and you've been window shopping God and the Bible and the claims of Christianity, I'm gonna give you the opportunity right here and right now to step over the line and become a Christian, to receive the gospel. It isn't mystical. It isn't magical. God's gonna hear the faith in your heart right now. If that's you, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and the sins of the world. I believe you died there, and I believe you rose from the grave so I could have everlasting life. Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, and give me the power to live this life for you. Lord, I'm tired of running. Here's the steering wheel of my heart. Take over. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen.